is not Sam Wrestling. Introducing your host from New York, here is Sam Roberts. Welcome back to Not Sam Wrestling. Fresh off a trip to Alaska, ladies and gentlemen, the buzz killer. Pat Buck is here. What's going on, man? What's the haps? Hang on one sec, Pat. Try again. Is it better now? No, no, no. There it is. Yep, that's it. All right. There we go. I'll probably introduce you again. That's probably the easiest thing to do. (laughs) Uh... Back on Not Sam Wrestling, fresh off of a trip to Alaska, he is the owner, the head, and a star of WrestlePro. He is the buzz killer. He is Pat Buck. Pat, what's the haps, man? A lot's changed since I've been uh, been here last time, so I think we have a lot to talk about, and Alaska is probably the most interesting thing I could talk about. It's certainly the most recent thing, right? Yeah, I just got off the plane yesterday, so... I mean, it was pretty nuts, so I heard, of course, you know, WrestlePro... Is kind of the little company that could. It's your, mm-hmm. it's your, uh, you know. And we talked about it when you kind of were first starting WrestlePro. That that was your way of going. You know, it looks like I'm not getting a ton of opportunities in the world of wrestling to make a full time living. Mm-hmm. So you got to this point where it was either invest everything and just go for it and do WrestlePro and create a pro and and create create this thing that can make a full time living or go and do something else and and this thing has paid off for you huge to the point that like a couple months ago I started seeing stuff online that you were like you know nobody's really done an independent wrestling show in Alaska Mm -hmm. I should be that guy kind of yeah that's exactly right with the whole how I started promoting and and switch from being a wrestler guy to promoter booker trainer guy it was part of it was for survival where it was like hey I can stay in this when I left early, when I left FCW or, or early NXT, whatever you want to call it, I went back to the independent scene. And at that time, it was 2012. I don't think it was the animal that it is today. And I was wrestling for a lot of places that were not rewarding. I couldn't, you know, I had no. And coming off of FCW in 2012 is certainly not coming off of NXT in 2019. Sure. Like it's too different. Every, the whole world, I mean, it's so weird that 2012 was really not that long ago. But the whole wrestling world was a completely different space. Everything has changed. Everything. You know, it's changed from three years ago, to be honest. So at that time, I went, I started wrestling for a lot of places, and I didn't have a lot of input. I wasn't really happy with, you know, um, I loved being in the ring, but there was just so many, you know this as a wrestler in, in any business, that that the in-ring part's a fun, fun stuff, but everything else was just a drag. And I said, I don't know where my career is going to go, so let me try to put on one show and one show turned into I think 180 right now but see that like that's so interesting because you go you know everything that's not in ring is such a drag how do I control the stuff that's not in ring I kind of got to be the guy in charge right yeah yeah 100 so at least I can uh, well I just kept you know for those people that eventually start their own thing or are thinking about it you you have these thoughts like man I think I can do this a little bit better and I started having those thoughts you know I hate to be somewhat arrogant but sitting in OVW locker room for so long after just wrestling a four or five minute match on TV and having all that time and I'd be like hmm I think this would be a lot better and I would never speak up about it but all these thoughts over the years and all these different locker rooms I went you know what let me stop thinking about it let me just try it so that led to you know the first show and then people thought I was crazy to start training school because at that time who are you you're just a guy that spent some time in developmental why would anyone want to train with you right it's not like that you're putting a name on the marquee yeah right not a tv star not a hall of famer not whatever you at the time i was you know i was 27 years old why mm-hmm. would i want to learn from you're kind of a failed wrestler and i'm like yeah I, I kind of but here's what i do know in the ring and that led to i think creative pro has one of if not the one of the top if the not the top training schools in the country between <laughs> yeah. new jersey and new york well all of a sudden you went from like that story to also, yeah, I, I run this school uh, with my partner, mm-hmm. who's one of the Raw Tag Team Champions That's now. true. <laughs> like, it's such a weird... Because Kurt Hawkins, like, and uh, you, the school that you're describing was before Hawkins was involved, 
But even when Hawkins gets involved, yeah, this is when he's not in WWE. Sure, yeah, because right? I mean, and that's another thing where it's like, okay, well, you know, Hawkins was cool in WWE and he was an edgehead, but at the time, we don't know or quite frankly think that he's going back. Yeah. So it's like, okay, again, I'm, I'm. It's not like he's this giant, massive star. It's like, but he knows what he's doing. Mm-hmm. So it's like we're having Pat Buck and Brian Myers now evolving your school into Creator Pro, and all of a sudden, Russell Pro does what Russell Pro does yeah. alongside you. Hawkins ends up splitting away, going back to WWE, but Hawkins does what Hawkins does, mm-hmm. and you're left with this monster. Kind of, yeah, pretty much. And it, it's, but it just goes to show you that if you're passionate, that the reason why we hung on so long is passion. You know, uh, when Hawkins was released from WWE, like he had so much passion to go out there and be like, "All right, I'm an indie brother now. I'm doing everything." And that led to, you know, we started the school a little earlier than that because he came to my school and was like, "Man, I love this. Let's open one." Okay, cool. Let's open one. So we did that, and I think him and I being around and being so passionate about wrestling 24 hours a day has led to, I think him and I both have had the wildest month in pro wrestling. You know, this month has been absolutely crazy mm-hmm. and, and rewarding. And now we get to look back and go, oh man, all those sacrifices, all, all those investments are are worth it. And yeah, now I kind of, you know, he's still very much involved in Creator Pro. Uh, Russell Pro is kind of my own thing. Um, but as far as the training schools, you know, everything's been pretty good, man. Yeah. And, and you know, and you got, you're, you're really quickly too, I feel like, we talked to MJF when he was here, uh, right? It was like the week before he announced he was doing AEW, and he said, "Oh, I don't know what I'm going to be doing." <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but like you already have somebody like that who's a graduate of Creative Pro to mm-hmm. be like, the results are already showing, and it's not been in business for all that long. Yeah, we've been around. I think five years. I've been training people seven years, and that was another thing where over time people come down to the school and they go, "Well, who's in WWE that you trained?" And I go, "Nobody." Right. You know, who who's done this or that? And I'm just open and honest where I'm like, look, there's going to be. But a lot of times, a lot of these wrestling schools would be like, hey, we're responsible for this guy. Just because a guy trained there for a week or maybe he came there for three months. To <laughs> it's season. like those comedy barkers in Times Square. They're like, you like Dave Chappelle? Come to this comedy <laughs> club. And you're like, Dave Chappelle's never been to this comedy club. That's exactly how it is. <laughs> like they've been through the building or took a picture in that building and or somehow, you know, someone started there and and it's the wrong mindset I, I tell people I want to check out my school hey come watch a class that I teach and you decide if it's for you or not so um, but luckily this year things are changing where a lot of our guys do have NXT tryouts mm-hmm. MJF signed with All Elite Wrestling um, I was just told yesterday that one of our uh, most promising students has a tryout coming up for in in July for the Performance Center so it's it's that's changing too a lot of our guys are all over uh, Wrestlemania and and Big Dave Batista's entrance and and carrying Velveteen Dream to the ring and whenever they're up here, uh, WWE is really relying on Creator Pro, which is awesome. Yeah, it was cool to see that whole weekend. Yeah, you know, checking on uh, Miz and Shane McMahon as they crash through yes. uh, 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 MetLife Stadium and everything. Um, so, you, how does the opportunity to run Alaska pop up? Because Wrestle Pro is not a touring group, right? I mean, it is in the sense that maybe locally. We have no backers. We, we're truly independent wrestling. Right. Like, yeah. you're just sitting there, and you are making the call to, to get the building in Rawway, to get the building over here, to get this building over there. But, like, outside of New Jersey, New York area, have you run – I mean, how many shows have you run outside New York, New Jersey? Not many. There's been a couple in near Philadelphia. Uh-huh. There's been one or two in Connecticut. And right. And that's really, that's really it. So then you go, well, you know, we could try – the Midwest, we could try the South. Uh, let's let's try Alaska. Yeah. How does exact. this come about? <laughs> well, to break that down too, just because you have such a smart fan base that listens to the show and they hear independent wrestling and they think of, I guess, every almost every promotion outside of WWE they consider independent wrestling. But the thing is that right. a lot of these places have companies backing them where, you know, true independent to me is it's one guy or a family just backing and, and paying all the bills and trying to make it work. So and when you say a family, you mean a traditional family, not traditional like family. the Khan family, no. for example. Yeah, <laughs> I, would, I would love if some sort of you know NFL team would like to back WrestlePro right. more than open because technically WWE is backed by a family. True, very. It true. just happens to be the McMahon family. But most independents are backed by people who 
are working full time jobs to support that independent right. promotion. So that to me, that's the spirit of independent wrestling. So same thing with WrestlePro. It's just me um, for this show in particular. The way it happened is like uh, you're kind of running a show so that you can pay for the next show. Yeah, and the next show, pretty much, and the next show, and that's it's like if one show crashes, it's gonna hurt and won't put us out of business. Yeah, like, oh man, you know, three shows that are bad. Yeah, I'm gone. <laughs> so, so that's it. Kind of. After five years or however many years it's been, three bad shows, Th- and you're toast. Three high, bu- oh, three high budgeted shows. Yeah, we're gone. That's it. We're 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 completely gone. So the way this came up was so, um, we, which leads us to yeah, it's a good idea to run Alaska. <laughs> Hey man, got it. Everything was has been a coin flip in my career. Everything has been take a chance or, you know, when I went down, not to keep going back to the past, but you know, I was never offered a contract with WWE. It was kind of, hey, move down to OVW, Kentucky on your own dime, take that chance. So I've taken chances and some of them have failed and some of them paid off. You know, doing the show, I had whatever money my savings account to put on one professional wrestling show was that or put a down payment to go back to college uh, or to go to grad school and i went ah let me run this wrestling show what would you have gone to grad school for i wanted to work i wanted to be a physician's assistant school's always been really easy to me and and i wanted to work in the health field somehow and i thought doctor would be a little bit too long so i wanted to work somewhere where i could you know um Work in the medical field, but mm-hmm. I went to, hey, let me put on a pro wrestling show in the rec center. Put on a wrestling show. It's exactly it. Mm-hmm. So, but with Alaska, we, we I heard about this, uh, I, over, as time goes on, I've been really blessed where I'm actually being used by a lot more companies now, and between working and producing and coaching, that my time with WrestlePro, I've been pulled away a bit, so I've had to rely on, you know, different people one of them being km from who was formerly with impact wrestling one of my best friends uh he's kind of the booker for wrestle pro now and he was loves alaska he goes there he he enjoys it and oh really like he vacations he, he, he well he went there once last year right right and he just fell in love <laughs> fell in love okay and then we heard about this wrestling show 15 years ago that ran in alaska that did very very well mm-hmm. that had like road warrior animal on it a couple of ecw guys and apparently they like rocked the place and they killed it and I, we started looking into it and when WWE goes there maybe once every five years and I looked at it from, he's like, do you want to do a show in Alaska? I'm like, eh, I don't know. But then, Did you look at like what WWE draws that they only go there every five years? Did yeah. they do well or do they only do okay? You know, I think they do very well, but I think the big thing with Alaska, the problem is travel and the unpredictable right. weather. And you can only run within a certain, uh, you know, you can run any month, but you're running into problems right. when you're running. So that's, you know, April and October were ideally the ones that were the best months where there's not a lot of terrible weather. Or from what we hear, we and we also hear that um, the the busiest times of year for them are winter and summer because people do migrate there. But for the cost of the arena, all these the, the numbers attracted me to Alaska. Mm-hmm. I looked at that, and and luckily I've been blessed with I know how to do this financially. So I looked at it like the building was very affordable compared to you know New York, New Jersey area where everything is expensive. The only burden was travel. But what we did was really, we did our homework. So we teamed up with a local promotion there that does run shows. They run, you know, there is Alaskan wrestling, believe it or not. There's they not to the level of other places, but they do their best. So we teamed up with them. So we had the equipment. We had boots on the ground. Um, we had so a lot you didn't of, have to like figure out how to get a ring to Alaska, for example. That was the biggest fear. So yeah. There's only one professional wrestling ring in Alaska that was was not even. There's mo- one, ring, one in the, ring in the state? One <laughs> ring. And we found it. Uh, and we, we worked in it. It was a 16 foot ring. The guy built it from scratch. Yeah. It's so, so it's not like it, like somebody crazy went and got one from high spots no. or something like that. It's a guy who built a ring. He built a and ring. And that's Alaska's ring. That's Alaska's ring. Yeah. It's incredible. It's, it's absolutely amazing. And I, that was my biggest concern. My biggest concern is, okay, like it was a couple days before the show. And I'm like, we have all the talent in town. I just picture there being no ring. And I picture rolling out like the blue mats, like a Nikolai Volkov YouTube video. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, what are we going to do? But but the ring was there and I was blown away. It was really nice. It was a little bit of a stiffer bump and the ropes were a little thinner, but it was a decent ring. But it had ring. ropes. And it had mat. ropes. And, it, had, and it, it was a ring. It, yeah. was, it was well kept. So, you know, and uh, I'll put the promoter over. His name is Matt Plant. You know, he raised a lot of local sponsorships. People went, whoa, what is, they saw the poster, like, we want to be involved. So there's more sponsorships on that show than any show I ever ran in my life. You know, we had Budweiser and the Army, we had all these different things that helped contribute and get 
uh, cut a lot of costs. So it to me, it looked like a worthwhile venture. And you brought up Mick Foley. Yes. That's the big, big, big name that you brought up, right? Yeah, it was. we knew that we had to go in there big. We couldn't just do, hey, we're running wrestling. No one will come. So Johnny Impact came, right? Johnny Impact, uh, uh, Taya Valkyrie, right. uh, Hornswoggle. We also had you know Janella and MJF, Cabana. And all of our local guys, you know, well, I hate saying local guys, our Wrestle Pro regulars. We we wanted to make that too. We didn't want to just be like, hey, we're going to put on a wrestling show. Part of the pride, and I'm glad this happened, is we, you know, we brought our own crew out there. We flew them out. We paid for their hotels. We paid for their. That's nuts. It was nuts, and it was very scary to go. Well, you and know. that's not. I mean, you would know better than me, but I in I feel like that's very atypical that a promotion would decide, okay, we're going to run in Alaska, and then fly their regulars up yeah and post them up in hotels like that, that doesn't it's not gonna happen right you it know? doesn't happen even for me now i love being out there in the indie scene i realize i got to get myself to a lot of places because it not that promoters are cheap they're not it's just there's no money from it right so the it, cost is crazy but i would also imagine that your guys number one that builds like crazy it's got to build insane loyalty to the brand of wrestle pro from the guys as if they didn't have it before mm -hmm. they're like oh because you know, it's it's about from the, what what's happening at the top because that's what really rolls down. Yeah, and the fact I think I would imagine if I'm a if I'm a local wrestle pro regular, and I don't really have these opportunities. I'm not getting flown to Alaska anywhere by anyone. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, you know what? I'm 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 down for wrestle pro, and then I find out that you are not only booking Alaska, but you're like, I want the wrestle pro regulars there so much so. That I'm flying you guys, and I'm putting you up in hotels, and I'm doing this. To me, that makes me go, I'm going to bust my ass for WrestlePro. This guy believes in it this much. Mm -hmm. He's treating me like a star all of a sudden. Yeah, I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to be a star for him, right? Yeah. I, to be honest, I never thought of it that way, but I I, I, I guess that is true. You know? I would hope so anyway. I just looked at it like I looked at these guys that they deliver on my shows, and, and they just haven't had the platform to really – uh have the light shine upon when the light is shine upon them they'll they'll accelerate they'll rise but I, I knew that it was just important to have our brand of guys up there because if this does become a regular thing which we are going to run alaska again <laughs> is that they have to be familiar with our talent they can't walk in and just expect well who, what what's going to be the hodgepodge of whatever i bring up there let's see these guys that we saw you know really kick butt last time and and get them over and long term for wrestle pro even on a local level it's one thing to say, oh, Pat, the guy who promotes these shows, also promoted a show in Alaska. It's another thing to say, no, this brand that we watch in Rawway, New Jersey, mm -hmm. those the brand, the guys, the everything took that show to Alaska. It makes it feel like a promotion. Yeah, no, exactly. That's exactly it. And it was it was scary, but you know, I'm I'm pretty open with things. We had a seven thousand seat arena. I knew we weren't gonna fill it. Ticket sales were eh and we, we had thirteen hundred people there. So, you know, for the highest attended event I've ever ran was like 1,600. So that's – but the thing is there is that 1,300 people in Alaska, when you compare costs and all these different things to New York, New Jersey, is really equal to like about 4,000 people if I ran a show in, in, in Rahway. Mm -hmm. It's crazy these different things, these different math and, and, and just figuring out all these different expenses – but it, it worked. There was a small profit. It wasn't much, but enough. We're like, oh, we pulled this off. Everybody had a good time. We didn't lose our butts. We, we made a little smidgen of money. And hey, let's do this again. And now we know what mistakes not to Because we made mistakes. So now we know what to do and what not to do when we go back there, which I think we'll go back there in December. Wow, that soon. Yeah. <laughs> so like in six months. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. So was there any panic? I know like, and this is on such a lower scale, but when I'm doing my live shows, my live podcast and whatnot, I love doing the show. Mm -hmm. I hate putting them together because I have ticket anxiety mm. for like weeks leading up to it. Like yeah. it's, it's on my, like it's just somewhere in my brain at all times, especially when like, and I don't even ask what the pre-sales are. And then they'll email and say like, hey, you think you go and do a little more promotion because the ticket sales are this? And I go like, oh, it's even lower than I thought. And it always ends up fine. Yeah, that's the Because people come to the door and people like, I've never had a show where I look out into the audience and I'm like, oh, this was even, every show I've ever done has been like, oh, this is, thank God, this is so much better than I thought. But did you have any moments of panic for this show yes. when you're looking at the pre-sales? Oh God, yeah, because I, I remember early on, 
you know, I'm I'm a I'm an optimist, but I'm a realist. And and my my booker KM is an over optimist to the point where he's like, if we sell out this building, the gate is like three hundred and thirteen thousand mm-hmm. dollars. I'm like, yeah, I don't think we're gonna get there, <laughs> but you know, let's let's hope. And we set these goals because we've been promoting the show for about eight months. So we're like, okay, maybe by like January, three months before the show, maybe we'll be at like fifteen hundred tickets. And we were really at like four. So it's like, and in my head, I'm like, do I pull the plug? Do I move forward for this? But then part of the, it, it, it's, if you have, if you're running your own thing and, and you said it the exact same way is there's overly, this, there's always going to be this overly panic. And then when it happens, you're like, okay, it worked out. Yes. So I just kind of have to trust in that. And it's like, but I also prepare myself. I always think what's the worst case scenario. And I go, okay, that's going to happen. I'm going to lose this amount of money. Uh-huh. So I convince myself that this is going to happen. And then when it slowly starts getting away from that, I go, okay, thank God. And right. it's, it's kind of it. It's over preparation. We could have done a way better job. I think we did a really good job and it worked out. But, you know, if it would have been a loss, I still would have probably looked at it as a success. But luckily, it, it was somewhat of a financial success. Right. And all you really, I mean, as long as you're not losing money, it's worth doing. I mean, the, the idea that you guys are running Alaska has a value in and of itself no i think i think the big thing is and i want to prove myself there, there's a lot of other companies out there outside of wwe that they they may not be doing so well and their budgets may be overinflated. and i think it's kind of alarming and also rewarding that two jabron wrestlers from new jersey <laughs> uh put together this and put on a profitable show bringing up all their own local talent mixed with a Hall of Famer, mixed with TV talent to Alaska and can turn profit. Why can't other companies do this? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so that's kind of, there's so many companies out there that have this good exposure, or they have a network or they have things behind them. And I guarantee you they're looking at their budgets and show after show they're losing money. And it's, it's something's wrong with that. So I think what I wanted to prove was that if you have the right people in charge of things, wrestling can be booming and big business, but most of the time it's not it's not happening so part of that was i just wanted to prove that again like hey we're doing this how come other places can't or or even on the independent level where there's so many shows that you just hear about just cancel you know they're running in their home area Mm -hmm. and they're panicking on ticket sales and they just cancel and screw over all the guys it's like it shouldn't happen if we can do this in alaska why can't you do this in your home area right no that makes total sense what was what were the fans like? I mean, was there this thing? Because I would imagine that Alaska is one of the places that gets talked about where there's so little that comes through there that there's they they become the thirteen hundred that were there must have been like super passionate because how often is there a wrestling show in Alaska? They were they were starved for it. It was interesting too because you work a lot of places and you see. They are, I don't want to say kind of like a Southern crowd, but you could tell that most of that whole crowd was there to see Mick Foley. Like the, his line was endless. They own, they, which by the way, if you're Mick Foley has to feel great because you know, I look, he's a legend, but he's also out there, right? Like yeah. he does a lot of signings. So sure. I'm sure some are crazy successful and he's probably had some that are not as successful. So to go to Alaska and get reminded like, Oh yeah, mm-hmm. I'm the legend. I'm the hardcore legend, Mick Foley. Sure. Like this is the impact that I'm still having on people it has to be amazing. And I love Mick cause he's one of those guys that, I mean, you can put him, he's in the top 10 of anywhere really of all time, you know, in my opinion, as far as what he's done for wrestling and he's still accessible to take this risk with. And, and he wanted to be up there cause he's never worked Alaska before. So this is on his bucket list. It's just so cool that, that he's still thinking on those terms. You oh, know what I mean? That a he's... couple people have reached out. They're like, I never worked Alaska. I have to. And I'm like, all right, maybe next time I'll get you on, but <laughs> sorry. You know, the, the crowd was so different in the fact that they, you know, I was listening from the first match on and you do an arm drag and they were receptive to it. And I'm like, Oh, I haven't, I haven't experienced that in a while where, you know, you're, you're in front of these bloodthirsty crowds and these independent scenes and you have to do, you know, I'm doing twisting tombstones to get a reaction. Right. So they were so passionate and so much fun. And that 1300 people really did sound like it was a sellout. They were so loud. And, and, you know, the last match, which I, uh, I was lucky to headline my own card, put myself in the internet. <laughs> but it was me and MJF versus uh, me versus MJF versus Janela with Mick as a special enforcer. And, you know, we were doing kind of ridiculous stuff with which, weapons and which, stuff. Which, by the way, is perfect for the buzz killer character. Yeah. Because you take the two guys with the most indie buzz. And, exactly. And you go out and you kill it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you go out there and we're doing, you know, we're doing 
doors yeah, and staple and and this crowd is like what are we seeing we fought through the we fought through the crowd and and to us it's like no big deal you do that on a lot of shows you just fight through the crowd once we cross the guardrails you could just hear the panic and excitement of the crowd it was like WWE doesn't do this it was like an old school like <laughs> Japanese deathmatch crowd when like Leatherface would come out into the audience and they'd all run and scurry and they, well, they or were like a Bruiser Brody match yeah. yeah it was just wild it was wild and the, the show was like three hours so I think it's on the longer side and while we're doing promos at the end and just kind of thanking the crowd you got the feeling that these people didn't want to go home they just wanted to like hang out and chill and Thank you for being here. So I really think the next time we go back there is going to be, you know, I expect all those people plus one, I hope. But it was it was it was definitely one of the most passionate crowds I've worked in front of ever in my life by far. And it's kind of pretty like amazing that you just said you figure out early. Oh, we can just an arm drag gets a reaction. We really don't have to mm -hmm. go above and beyond. But the two clips I saw from your match, one of them <laughs> was stapling an autograph Mick Foley eight by ten to MJF. Yep, and the other was. A tombstone off the top <laughs> rope onto a door that was not perched on the second rope? Two doors. Two doors so perched we, on the second okay. We had a door on the... Again, I, I'm losing my... I, it's weird. I, I kind of like this random, hardcore, crazy wrestling these days, even though I'm a traditionalist with, with all my wrestling stuff, but... You know, we put a door on the, on, the, on the bottom rope and then another door on the second rope. It's like, hey, <laughs> how about a tombstone through both of them? And I remember looking at Mick a couple of times and he's just, when you see Mick Foley look at you like, I think you got, you're, you're kind of crazy, man. Like there's two times I looked at him and he was just like, what are you guys doing to impress him? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that was like, and he even said to us, he goes, you know, I give you guys a lot of credit. He pulled us all aside after he goes, a lot of the guys in the situation would look at the crowd and go, you know, let's let's just get by. Right. They'll eat up everything, which is what you just said. And you guys went out there and are, you know, do wrestling very hard, but also throwing in the extra, you know, because a lot of people think that's the stuff like the stables and the thumbtacks, but they're appropriate if you put them in the right sort of story of the match mixed with hard hitting stuff and, and character stuff. And we got Sako in and we got all these things. You know, <laughs> they go, what was the Sako reaction like? Pretty, pretty loud. Yeah. Uh, pretty loud. <laughs> Definitely was, uh, yeah, it was, it was deafening. So, it, it, it just worked out. We, we wanted to work our butt off to prove. And I think I know the fans there were like, what are we seeing? And I think that's what won them over. We haven't had a bad review on the show yet. So it's been it was it was definitely one of those like spiritual things that I'm, I'm so glad I did. When did doors become the thing? Like I noticed that the, <laughs> the tables, you know, and, and, and this is to me, I feel like. The indie wrestling that you were talking about that actually has backers and has people behind it, it's not really independent. Mm -hmm. They use tables. Yeah. Real indie wrestling uses doors. That's true. Doors doors are the new tables. And when did that become and why? Because I think it's always should have been a thing. I don't know if in ECW they ever thought about doors, because I remember I overheard Heyman saying this that like tables have always been expensive. Yeah. They've been super expensive just to get those wooden cafeteria like tables that snap and break. Because it's not like, and, and I don't know if people, I, I think that people who listen to this show are aware enough of what's going on. But I think growing up, you go like, oh, you know, they probably have ECW is grounding up their own sawdust and making these like <laughs> fake tables no. or whatever. And you're like, no, they're going to Home Depot and buying a whole bunch of tables before a show. And what changed was Home Depot and Lowe's, they switched from those types of tables to the plastic folding tables. So they're not in existence. Oh. Yeah. So you go online, believe me, any promoter listening to this knows, knows the strife of trying to find tables. And occasionally one will pop up on Amazon for like 60 bucks. But most of the time they're like 140, 160 bucks. Wow. So so I think the plastic tables really, you know, they, they, so they, they put to bed that. So they're like, what else do we do? And someone somewhere said, let's get a door. And doors are like 50, 60 bucks, 40 bucks. It's about the size of a table. It actually makes better noise. Uh -huh. um, it's a little bit, sometimes it can be heavier or lighter, but you know, it's so funny because fans are still at, we want tables. It's like, sorry, here's your door. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully doors get out. I'm going to try, I, maybe I can get doors over on the indie scene more. I'm surprised that like Home Depot, especially in indie towns where there's a lot of wrestling mm -hmm. jersey and, and and new york and places like that i'm surprised that they don't realize how much business there is in like <laughs> table wooden tables double-sided ladders like all that stuff you would think that they would stock it at least for the weekends oh it's so funny you know the double-sided ladder i never i should learn that from bruce he, he when we had him up here for wrestle pro he, he goes Hey, go to Home Depot and you can customize a ladder to be, you know, double sided. And I went, they'll do that for me. He goes, yeah, it's the same cost. As long as they know that you're going to get it, they'll make it for you. I'm like, 
I did not know that. So I need to get those uh, double sided ladders. Yeah, because if you that's and that's the other thing. Like if you see a double sided ladder on an indie show, I know as a fan, it's impressive. I go like, oh, <laughs> this is legit. Because then again, I go back to my little kid thing, and I go like, oh, they, I guess they have the Wrestle Pro Ladder Factory where they make their own ladders too. Because that doesn't look like the ladders that I see. It's so true. It's yeah. these little detail things that make you appreciate wrestling. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so, so the Alaska show was a was a big success then. Uh, yeah, I think so. You know, I think it's a success for anyone that took part in it, the fans. Um, it seemed like morale, like I follow a bunch of, of you guys on Instagram and Twitter and everything. And it just seemed like everybody involved with the show was just so excited about doing it. Yeah, and we're, we're a real brotherhood. We're all friends in real life. So it, it's kind of just, you know, we're a mix of up and comers and then other guys that maybe kind of in, I don't want to say they're in a twilight, but they're just like, this is where I'm going to be wrestling and, and that's it. And then a couple guys that could be signed tomorrow. So right. You know, mixed in with, you know, a lot of our, some of our guys do work, you know, MJF is signed here. Falaba is signed here. So like, you know, and, and also a lot of, you know, it's funny, a lot of the, the people that work for other TV companies, they have a better time with Russell Pro than they do their own. That, mm-hmm. And that, I hate to say that, but that's the truth because we at least were, you know, you're going to have a good time if you work for Russell Pro. It's, and you're never going to be put in a situation where you're like, oh, I hate this. We're, we're, we're pretty easy going. Well, so. that's kind of the mission statement of the company, right? That's why you started the company. Kind of, So yeah. that it was not so miserable when you weren't wrestling. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we're always going to have our issues with, you know, people that don't want to, you know, uh, maybe not want to put people over or the regular stuff that happens yeah. in wrestling. But for the most part, it's, it's an easygoing locker room and, and, they have granted me enough respect where I call the shots and the people listen and uh, it's worked out so far. So I'm hoping to bring it. I really want to run a show in every single state. That's the goal. Well, that's what I was going to say. Like, do you, I guess that's the sort of macro level goal, but after Alaska happens and it's a success, Mm -hmm. I guess apart from this idea, like, okay, let's plan on going back in December. Do you, immediately start thinking like okay well what's the next big thing that we're gonna do i can't just sit here and be the guy who went to alaska once i want to do hawaii now you do i really do and i'm hearing that there is an independent promotion out there (laughs) and they have two rings in hawaii hopefully so (laughs) you have to go to the right island though yeah 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 yeah. but i I hear there is an independent wrestling promotion out there and i think if we just go hey look what look what i did for alaska i can bring this here i can bring this roster here and pull it off you know, if not, I'll I'll find maybe Montana or Wyoming, just something something weird and different where it goes like, oh, that's kind of cool. That that's really all. It's about the stories. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm having enough fun doing my thing as as a performer in other companies with my own. I kind of want to do something different. So, go yeah, I mean, to random places. And how many of these? How many independent promotions are going with the traveling circus? business plan i mean i don't no. think any no they, they they get you know they find their venue they put on their good you know most are about content and, and and buzz in their own thing and we've kind of done that but kind of we're more of a live event thing and it, it is to me a circus so let's try to run you know north dakota and and nebraska just just so we can have it in conversation you know what i mean yeah. like that's kind of it's just having fun and being weird and and it's cool for stuff. for the the guy the wrestlers on the show to be able to be like, no, I'm working North Dakota this weekend, you know, because <laughs> yeah. they never like, like you said, they're going like, okay, I'm a Russell Pro guy, I'm a New Jersey independent Russell Pro mm-hmm. performer, and to be able to go like, oh, I can't this weekend, I'm working North Dakota, it's like, <laughs> it's so great. It is cool, it right? Is really, really like, cool. It's 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 amazing. Um, well, man, and and I've noticed too that you're you're getting way back into wrestling. Yeah. Like I saw the promos that you started uh, putting out on Instagram and whatnot. That's why I referred to you as the as the buzz killer. Sure. Uh, which I love because it kind of leans into this idea of like, look, you're being realistic. Like there's all these guys out there with all this buzz. Where's this guy going to end up? Where's this guy going to end up? You have focused your attention on more of the business end of this mm-hmm. stuff. So you go, okay, well, if I want to be in that conversation, but I'm not one of those guys on that list, why don't I be the guy that wants to destroy the people that are on that list right and to be honest okay so i started doing this per- I, I realized things are different this year and i want to be something just lit up where i said i want to do as many matches as i can I because be there. there was a time when you told me you were like i don't think i want to do matches anymore pretty much i would right. just wrestle for myself but what changed so much there was changed. even a time i i think when you were like i'm gonna do like a couple matches for wrestle pro but i don't even think i want to wrestle for wrestle pro anymore there- i just want to be able to put these shows on yeah i i thought that the end game changed where I saw myself, you know, just trying to launch Wrestle Pro and promote shows and work behind the scenes more. And then as I saw things expand this year with All Elite Wrestling, with, 
you know, MLW blowing up, Ring of Honor expanding, all these different things happening, and and WWE even expanding everything. Uh, I just went, man, like part of something. There was a couple weekends where I was at home and I wasn't running a show, and I was just on the couch, and I went like, I can't do this anymore. I need to be out there. I need to be in the ring. And it, the truth is, I, I base this persona. It's completely real, you know, because I've had. You, you just heard me talk about a lot of success with promoting and stuff like that. It eats away at my soul the fact that I didn't get to a certain level as a performer. Mm-hmm. I didn't get the recognition that I, I really rightfully believe I deserve. And I see all these people. I love the fact that, you know, my students are signing somewhere, but there is going to be a part of my soul that went, how come you were never there? What happens? Yeah, like what what is that? I would imagine that a lot of this is based on even the people who aren't necessarily your students, like you talked about, Joey Janela, who we've had on this podcast. Mm-hmm. Like, while he's not necessarily one of your students, you were running shows when he was just a young kid, yeah. and now you're watching people like him, whether they're your students or not, progress and seeing like, oh wait, like for the people who stick with this and get good and find themselves and create personas, like this is happening for them. It's happening for them. Like I said, the end game change where I went, wow, like there's a lot of stuff out there. So I had these ideas to put down, like maybe I could be this this. I, I there's a part I am pretty optimistic, but there is a part of me that's very very bitter, and that's what's motivated me to, to to keep with wrestling so long. And something lit up, and I said I'm in the ring more than most people I know at the training school, and I've I've never been out of shape, and I've always kept up consistency, and I know so much, and it bothers me that there's you know so much buzz out there, and I never got it for myself. So mm-hmm. let me be the buzz killer and go, you know work a different style and be a little bit more aggressive and, and hardcore in what I do. And and what was different and mind-blowing and so awesome is that NXT's changed the game. They changed the game in terms of now what you do before WWE matters. Like, it's yeah. part of your story. So when you go there, people are aware of what you've done. And because of that, I feel like whatever you do in the independent scene now matters. And what, what what's crazy is that I truly believe that my story as being a long-term somewhat if you can say failed performer that did everything he was supposed to do it, there there may be a couple of those out there but i don't think to the degree of what i went through and so i think by especially putting, but but especially because you can still go yes like a lot of the people <laughs> with that story like you could bring them in to tell that story but they're done yeah, yeah the reason that they're finally admitting they're failed performers is because they're not they can't do it anymore yeah and and, and, I, and I have a soft spot for a lot of those guys too because there's so many guys that you know that i know of that could have been you know main WWE roster people or big stars and something happened or they, they didn't get their break or whatever and i feel like i'm almost representing them like i'm the, the echoes of these unheard people that never got their their due and maybe they should have so all of this is very true it's very motivating it's the, it's the essence of my character i want to go against these indie darlings i want to you know okay you're you, you get all this internet buzz i've been doing this 17 years on a pretty high level let's see if you have what it takes to compete with me so what's crazy is I started reaching out to promotions before those videos dropped. And I thought maybe people like, yeah, okay. But a lot of these promotions were like, whoa, you're wrestling again? Okay, come on. And and I, I work for like, you know, 15 of the, some of the best promotions in the country now. And, and, I'm, and there's so many things on the horizon that I'm going to be debuting for that I, I didn't think that the, the rest of the scene would have the respect that uh, it's almost like it's, it's actually paying off. I have input in locker rooms. I'm trying to get something going in wrestling for the first time. There's never been something like a player coach, and I'm trying to create that in pro wrestling where I can be this guy that goes to these places, work with talent, and contribute behind the scenes as well. So Right, so when you book me for a show, I'll do the match, whatever, we'll do the thing, I'll mm-hmm. promote it on, on social media, we, I got the character, blah, blah, blah. But then also once I'm there, I'm going to get there early. Yeah. And we're going to, you know, and I'm going to be that guy that's kind of uh, sharing wisdom with the locker room yeah. and, and training and, and doing everything. And, and and more so, and there's a lot of guys out there that try to help the locker room, but I really try to find what's best because I'm doing it now. Like I, I found what's best for WrestlePro, so I have this, you know, uh, I'm not one of those cutthroat guys. I believe there could be success for everybody in wrestling. And there's a place for, most places focus on, I, I like focusing on the undercard. I like focusing on the tag team division, just different things that um, I'm very adamant about producing and coaching and that's kind of what i what i think a lot of these promotions are bringing me in for too it's it's a mix of hey go out there have a killer match but also we need some people back here to 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 regulate you know and 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 
and make this a better promotion. So that's my job now. I mean, I think this is happening all over the place. We had Mark Henry here on the show like a few weeks ago, and he said, and I had never even heard of this position being a thing, that his one of his new roles in WWE is to come in for the pay-per-views and just make sure the locker room is where it should be. Wow. And just okay. kind of be that that guy. I don't know if mentor or motivator is whatever, but just kind of make sure that everybody's behaving themselves in yeah. such a way and that the industry is in a place where where it's healthy for not only the people that are working in it now, but for the next several generations. Yeah, you got to check the pulse of every locker room. You could have things that, you know, if you're not, you know, I know how to deal with a lot of conflict in wrestling because I've been through it as a promoter, as a talent, whatever. So, you know, there could be issues. It could be someone that doesn't want to, I'm in locker rooms sometimes where they want to do, I don't want to say too much in the match, but they, they want to squeeze in 25 minutes worth of stuff into an eight minute thing. And that kills the show because they go over time. Then there's times where I meet guys that don't want to do anything in the ring. They don't even want to take a bump. And there there's just a way to kind of check the temperature of a locker room and make the card different. You don't want, you don't want the first match to do the same thing as the fourth match and figure out a way where you know we can deliver the best product that we can. So having a position like that is just super important, man. Yeah. And do you find too that maybe getting away from WrestlePro and going into these other promotions and realizing that there's this big respect for you, it kind of lets you know like, oh, like what I've been doing is being noticed. Because kind of when you're when you're in your home base, mm -hmm. you don't necessarily you're not necessarily aware fully of the effect that it's having outside, right? You stay in that WrestlePro bubble you do. and it's like you're just working towards the next show, working towards the next show, and that mentality of the mentality you had when you went through the first show and said, you know, people think I'm crazy for doing this, mm -hmm. kind of sticks with you until you get outside of it and go like, oh, people really respect what's happened here. They do. Well, the ones that pay attention do, because like there's a lot of locker rooms I go in and I can re I see that the there's, you know, half the people are aware. They'll talk to me about things. They're, they're aware. I'm aware of most of the talent when I like when I when I get booked on a card, I know a lot of the guys in the locker room. I'm aware of their, their story, where they come from, where they're going. And I find that the people that I kind of know, they're attentive and, and they know about me. But there's also half a locker room that that's they're just there once a month. Mm -hmm. So I try to find like the like minded people. And now that I'm out there, I'm actually trying to get out there so much where I'm actually going to bring in a lot more um, independent talents to wrestle pro. So and then also I can compare. I tell my locker room, I go, hey, this is where we're better and this is where we're worse. So I right. get to kind of go, hey, I saw this at, you know. CZW or Limitless. I saw this at these different places, and I think they do this a lot better than us, and this is where we need to improve. Or I could be like, hey, you guys are doing a great job, just so you know, it's not the same out there, but don't stop doing that. Were you surprised, and I, I mean, I say CZW just because you brought it up, but say a CZW or any promotion like it that would, you know, I mean, I remember, you know, when I was, when, when Jersey All Pro was around, or, or even, you know, right after that, that like, there was real war between promoters and yeah. not like like the type of war that like we can't do storylines here mm -hmm. because there's we are trying to sabotage these other shows behind the scenes we're yeah. trying to do a lot like when you go out there and like you're going to other people who primarily do shows in the new york new jersey connecticut philly area mm -hmm. are you kind of surprised that they're not like oh no you're a rival promoter we're not gonna <laughs> we're not gonna put you on a show that they're like no come I'm going to do a great match. I think in Jersey and New York, we've got so used to people just running so much. We don't have a lot of that. But right. let's just say Pennsylvania, Philly area, there's some of that going on. There's some of that going on in the Midwest right now, the Chicago area, mm -hmm. where people are, you know, telling their performers, you can't wrestle here. I just read that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's things there's things like that happening in, you know, there's some in New England I'm aware of where, you know, if you work one place, you may not work for the other. It's unfortunate, you know, and but there's also, it's not so black and white where it's like, Oh, we should be allowed to work everywhere, and it's also not black and white. Where, you know, the promoter should have the ability to to tell you what they want to tell you. But there's a way we can all work it out, yeah. really, and not just be. But unfortunately, a lot of places don't think the way that I do, or, or you know, because because in a way, when I first started, I kind of thought that way with a lot of things. Not to the well, I get the the business end of it, where you're like, well, we're trying to get people, even if it's not about you know uh, being vindictive about another promotion. There is that side where you're going. Well, we're trying to get people to pay tickets to see the people performing at these shows. Mm -hmm. If you're performing at every other show in the area, you know, what good does it do if I put you on the poster if they just saw you? 100%. And the same thing with storylines. If you start yeah. going to one of these really, you know, there's some great promotions out there. There's there's like AIW and Black Label Pro and AAW. And there's all these like great places beyond all this stuff. They have a lot of great storylines. So 
if you can't commit to month after month because you're taking all these bookings somewhere, mm -hmm. that does throw a wrench into their things. And a lot of times a performer doesn't value that. They don't put enough thought into, oh man, I'm really affecting this promoter's vision. So that becomes an issue. There, it also becomes an issue, I've ran into things before where you, know, we, you run a show on the same night and someone's like, hey, can I do both shows? And you gotta work your card around where totally. put them on second match so they can go on main event there. And I'm flexible with that, but I've noticed most places aren't as organized and they may not be. So that becomes an issue and you take it out on the talent and then more things happen. So, you know, independent wrestling is not perfect. It's still rough. It's still incredibly difficult to get out there, but you know, it, it, it's just the way it is. It's, it's unfortunate. Have you had any matches lately that you're like, oh man, that was an incredible match and then go, oh, I wish I'd done it in WrestlePro. There's been match. So I'm, so I'm learning. I'm just learning that every single independent wrestling promotion is different. That every single crowd expects, like, there, there's some times where I went in that there's a match I did recently where I thought it was a good match. Told a, to, I hate saying tell a story. I hate when people say that. But, like, it's just. If, Why? Because I feel like it's so cliche. Yeah, yeah, When yeah. people say tell a story, it's like, what does that mean? Right. You know, I. Yeah, when people are like, well, we were trying to tell a story in the ring. What story was it? And then they can't tell you what the exactly. story was. Yeah. Like, you know, and, and working someone's arm. To me, is that really a story? You just well, you, right. you, you beat well, up the this, arm for a little bit. It was a story of a guy whose <laughs> arm hurt. <laughs> You're going okay. It's just so, such a thing that people like rely on. I just it drives me nuts. But I anyway, gotcha. like I had a good match where it, you could follow a lot of things. But then looking back, there wasn't enough. I hate saying this. There wasn't enough moves in there. There wasn't enough, and that promotion needed these moments because they rely heavily on internet clips and different things like that. So even if I'm having this story that. You know, getting over these characters, it doesn't make for the most appealing internet clip, which is what they rely on. So I got to work a certain aggressive, almost throw psychology at the window and and do the hard hitting stuff here. And then other places are completely character based where they don't care about what you do in the room. You could hit, you know, all these different drivers and, and moonsaults and strikes. But if you don't have a character, you're not going to get over there. And if you're not going to if you're going to do this style here. The promoter's going to see that and probably not book you anymore. And if you do this style over there, I see. So that's the issue. I'm, I'm, I'm learning. So I'm, I'm going to these places and went like, okay, that's how I work here. And now I realize, all right, that didn't work so well. So when I go back there, I'm not gonna. I have to put on a different hat. And I, it's kind of a new learning experience for me because some all these indie places are so different. So you never know what to expect. Which is great too. It's also amazing to me that that the fan bases of some of these uh, independent promotions. Because there was a time where it was it, like they didn't have an identity, where it was just like this is just an. I'm going to go to an indie show this weekend, and you go to whatever show's running around you. Yeah. But the fact that you have such brand loyalty now, that crowds, audiences have expectations mm -hmm. for you that are different based on the shows that they're going to, shows you kind of how loyal to and aware they are of the brand that they're watching and how good these promotions are getting yeah. at figuring out, okay, before we know, you know, who do we have booked? Who are we as a promotion? Okay. Now who are we going to put on the show? Yeah. And you know, a, a big indicator of that was WrestleMania weekend when you had so many shows up here and you're all fighting for, you know, attendance and different things like that. And you can see the, the, the every hard, every fan that listens to this, you, every promoter, every fan, every wrestler, has a certain taste for wrestling. Yeah. You know, not most of them are not all encompassing. They like their particular, st you know, there, there's a lot of wrestlers that frustrate me that become, you know, power players eventually. And they only really like or appreciate the style that brought them to the dance. Mm -hmm. So when they see a different style be successful, they're not kind of warm to it. Like, yeah, that's, that's, that's whatever. I wish we could see past that, but that's how, that's almost the same thing as fans where, where certain fans go, you know, I put on a comedy show WrestleMania weekend called, you know, does funny equal money yeah. with all comedic acts. And some fans are watching this on fight TV. Like, I don't get this. Why can't we have a normal match? It's a comedy show. Right. You know what I mean? How can you not? And then other people will watch hard hitting, you know, all Japan wrestling or, or, or very aggressive style. And they either love that or they want, some want more characters. You can never satisfy everything, but it's cool that at least all these independent places, they're finding their identities. They're finding out, okay, what's our crew of guys? Who are the right guys to bring in? And a lot of places are doing fairly well, which is awesome to see. That's amazing. Well, I don't know if you can hear Lila upstairs, but that's the alarm. <laughs> um, uh, Pat, man, uh, I'm so happy that uh, you're, that the success is just, uh, it keeps happening and you keep kind of finding it and taking risks and it keeps paying off. 
Uh, where can people find you, find Russell Pro, and what's the next thing that we want to inform the folks of? Yeah, I think uh, you know, I'm on social media. Buck never stops. I don't know what my future holds. Kind of cool that I'm kind of bouncing around, and you know, I have three matches this week, and then I go to a certain place, and I'm going to do something here, and, and I'm working for a lot of major companies, and. and um, when that stuff, I don't want to be the person like, Hey, look at me, but it'll be, it'll get out there eventually. So, um, I'm, I'm after, you know, 17 years of, of ups and downs and stuff. I'm hoping that it, that it, that it continues on an upward path and I can kind of help out other talent and just keep growing and find some more success. But WrestleProOnline.com and CreatorProWrestling.com going to start your careers. And I guess just all my social media stuff to see where I'm going to be wrestling or producing or coaching or, you know, uh, I, I just all things wrestling, man. That's awesome. Create create a pro, wrestle pro, at Buck Never Stops. Thanks as always, man. It's been great. Thanks, Sam. Appreciate it.